potentially cell type specific maps of regulatory elements that you could overlay with the GWAS hits. Um, and there's been work showing that the <coughs> genome-wide association study hits enrich in regulatory elements in the biologically relevant cell type for some uh, disease studies. Um, but how, however, there's a number of um, challenges with this data is that oftentimes um, we don't have experimental coverage of a specific mark and a specific cell type we might be interested in. And even when we do have a mark in a given cell type, uh, there's potentially a lot of experimental variability or confounders in terms of um, genetic or environmental such that it can be very noisy um, thinking about just one map available from a given cell type um, as being representative of that specific cell type. <coughs> so uh, just to sort of recap, if you were at my previous talk, uh, we have lots of different epigenetic marks. In particular, a lot of the work I focus on is based on histone modification. So these are chemicals that are added to the histone proteins that the DNA is wrapped around. And you have a lot of um, different types of histone modifications, and where you get your specificity is in terms of uh, which histone protein could be modified, um, the specific amino acid residue, the type of chemical, whether it's like a methyl or acetylation, the number of occurrences of it, um, and then we have various notations for these uh, histone modifications. So it's saying, for example, the third histone protein, the specific um, residue, the type of modification, and in how many copies. And then the whole overall complex of protein and um, DNA is referred to as chromatin. And in addition to histone modifications, we can have other mo types of modifications such as DNA methylation, which we've heard about directly on top of the DNA, and also um, maps of open chromatin, so accessible DNA will also be a, a feature. Um, so just to remind you, um, histone modifications are mapped through an assay called CHIP-seq. So what's happening is you have an antibody that recognizes the specific uh, modified histones. You extract the DNA, which that histone modification is present at. Then you sequence and map back to the reference genome, and you can get these density maps. So I was in part of a consortium effort, the Roadmap Epigenomics Project. Um, it's sort of a sister project to the ENCODE project. It had more of a focus on primary cell and tissue types. So this is an um, image of various parts of the human body that the consortium tried to map epigenetic marks in. Um, it was a little more focused than ENCODE and specifically on the epigenetic marks. It didn't have the transcriptive factor binding marks, but it had a sort of a much um, more diverse set of histone modifications it profiled, and those up here uh, were mapped more deeply, and I'll talk about that in the next slide and how that's sort of going to raise the imputation um, questions. In addition, it mapped um, DNA methylation and RNA seq and DNA open chromatin. Um, so, this is what you're seeing here is a grid of the cell and tissue types that had coverage that were considered like reference epigenomes. And this was defined that they had to have at least five core histone modifications mapped in it. And they're organized by the larger um, groups, whether it's uh, ES, IPS, blood and T cells, um, so forth. And then there was also 16 cellular tissue types that were mapped by the ENCODE project that were processed through the same computational pro pipelines to look like it was um, data from the roadmap project. And the problem we're interested in is, say you have a grid like this. So as you can see, we have many uh, cell and tissue types for which we don't have complete coverage. But then we have some for which we do have uh, marks mapped in more cell types. Could we go from a grid like this to a grid like this where we have experimental data, but we also now have computationally imputed coverage of every experiment um, available. Um, and then even if we do have an experiment done 
we might want to also have a computationally imputed version of that experiment as well, and that can have a number of applications as I'll discuss. So why are we interested in this? Um, I mean, so there's a number of reasons. I mean, the most obvious is we're completing this data matrix. Uh, it might not be feasible to actually do this for a number of reasons. One is sometimes you don't have the biological samples material to do it because um, some of these samples can be very precious in terms of like brain or heart samples. Um, and then, th I mean, there's a large number of marks you would want to map. And then other times the limiting factor could be the experimental cost of the sequencing or the time involved in doing the work. And then, as I alluded to earlier, and this is somewhat of a more subtle reason, is you could potentially generate higher quality versions of the observed data sets. Because when we say we actually have one of these marks and one of these cell types, that could just mean we have one experiment done for it. And there's potentially a lot of um, things contributing noise. But when you generate an imputed version, you're potentially combining information from lots of very closely related experiments. You can gain a statistical robustness that you're lacking um, when you just rely on potentially one noisy observation. And this was um, a point that I had made during my previous talk. Uh, if we're interested in defining chromatin states, for example, so combinatorial patterns based on multiple marks consistent, in a consistent way across cell types, we're going to be limited in the number of marks that we could use or the number of cell types if we required ourselves to directly use observed data if we wanted it defined in a consistent way. So an alternative is we can first impute the data and then define the chromatin states based on the imputed data. Uh, and then even if we do have um, the observed data available, um, the imputed data could be useful as a quality control measure. So we can see, does the observed data agree with the imputed data? And if it doesn't, this could be a data set we should be concerned about. And it can also effectively work as a sort of a pseudo replicate, give you confirmation that this experiment is agreeing with um, what's expected. Um, and then it might be the case that overall some data set agrees w with um, the imputed data, but there could be specific surprising locations. Um, and this could potentially point you to something biologically interesting because the imputed data is effectively giving you a prior based on all your available knowledge of what you think an experiment should look like. And then if the observations at specific locations are disagreeing with this prior, you might um, be interested in those locations. And you could potentially um, hold out certain information forming the imputation to have a more interesting surprise. And a final point is it could also be used as one way to guide mark prioritization. So it's a question like given you have a new sample and a finite budget in terms of the material or co um, money you can spend, which marks should you prioritize? And if you can discover you can impute other marks very well just with these specific marks, and that could become a good argument that we should do these marks over these other marks, which we won't be able to impute based on anything else, potentially. And I'll talk more about that later. So at a very high level, the method that I um, had developed, which we called uh, Chrome Impute, uses two types of information to do the imputation. One is that you have other marks in the same cell type that you're trying to predict on. So we're making the assumption that for any mark that you're trying to predict in a specific cell type, you've observed that mark in other cell types, and you have other marks in the cell type you're trying to predict. So if you haven't observed a mark at all, or you haven't observed anything in a cell type, then um, the method isn't applicable. But we're assuming you've observed at least some marks in the cell type, and or at least one, and you've observed that mark in other cell types. Um, so what we can use is information about the other marks in that same cell type we're trying to predict. And then we're sort of leveraging the fact that the correlation structure between epigenetic marks is relatively well conserved across cell types. So it might be the case that like at different locations, you might have some epigenetic mark present in one cell type, but not in others. But the combinatorial relationship between marks is relatively well conserved across uh, cell types. So we can learn based on cell types for which we do have um, pairs of marks or more um, what their relationship is. And then in another cell type where we only have a subset of them, then we can um, extrapolate what those other marks should look like or infer.
Um, so the specific features which we're uh, using to represent other marks in the same cell type is the signal of each of the other marks at that target position we're trying to predict. And every 25 base pairs to the left and right until 500 base pairs. And then um, the signal of each other mark at 500 base pairs to 10,000 base pairs at 500 base pair intervals. The second class of features that we have is for a given mark that we're interested mm -hmm. in, we can look in other cell types, specifically at that location, what um, signal it had. So we can figure out what are some of the most similar cell types to this uh, target cell type for which we're interested in, look up the signal that mark in those other cell types for which we do have it, average their um, signal values, and use that as a feature. Um, and more specifically, what we do is we use uh, a k-nearest neighbors approach. I'll give a little more details on the next slide about uh, k-nearest neighbor approaches, where k can run from 1 to 10. And then when you're dealing with k-nearest neighbor methods, you have to also have a distance associated with it. And we have separate uh, features based on both local and global distance for each mark that we have available in the um, cell type for which we're trying to predict to define the distance to the nearest other cell types. And we create features thus based on each combination of K, each mark we have in the target cell type, and um, local and global distance. So um, in terms of K-nearest neighbors, um, as many of you are probably have seen this in a number of contexts, um, the idea with these K-nearest neighbors is uh, you have sort of a, if you just had one nearest neighbor, you would have a partitioning of the space. So if, if the black represented your training points and you had a new um, point that you wanted to classify or have a prediction based on, what you would do is figure out which point in your training data set it was closest to and then take that value as your prediction. Um, and then with k-nearest neighbors, it's a generalization of this um, where you're not just taking the single nearest neighbor, but you're taking the k closest points to you, and then you average their predictions. Um, and then for defining the distance, so what we do is we define the distance based on each mark separately that we have in the target cell type. And we have both a local distance measure, so this could be dependent on the specific position we're at. So what could be considered the nearest cell type in this, based on this metric will depend on what position you are in the genome. And what we do is we define it based on the Euclidean distance um, within a 500 base pair window uh, using the signal at every 25 base pair resolution between this other mark in the target cell type and each other cell type for which you have both the target mark and this other mark we're defining the distance based on. Um, and then globally, we have a distance measure based on 1 minus the Pearson correlation. So we focus on Euclidean distance for the local distance because we might not expect potentially much um, sort of covariation. Um, we could just expect things to be potentially high for both, mark, um, for both the target and other cell types. Um, but then we, for the global distance, we use um, 1 minus the Pearson correlation. Why global distance could be important Say you're having some mark which is the only mark at some location in the genome, then it won't be very informative to just use a local distance measure because any other mark that you have might just have no signal there if you had some mark that was the only one that had um, signal at some location. But by defining a global distance, it could still be the case that you could figure out in general which cell types are close to each other and that would still be relevant information for making the prediction of that target mark. <clears throat> so now the overall sort of framework for training this, I'll also give a few more details on the following slides. Um, so one of the key challenges here is we're assuming we have no training data for the target mark and the target cell type in this setting. So this isn't like a situation where you're like training on one chromosome and then testing on another. We don't have our target in, um, at all. 
Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to train predictors based on that target mark in every other cell type for which we do have data available. And then we're going to average the predictions of those. Um, and specifically, what I did was I generated uh, training data sets uh, based on 100,000 randomly sample, sampled data points for each um, cell type for which we have the data available. And we're training a separate predictor. And if it's a case that the mark is only available in a few cell types, you can form multiple bags um, and generate different sets of 100,000 data points and then train predictors based on that. And I did that in a few cases where the marks were available in fewer cell types. Um, and then the specific features that we use would be common to both the predictor cell type and the overall target cell type. So we're training on another cell type um, and we're taking sort of the intersection of available features both in the overall target cell type and the specific cell type we're using for training. Um, so then once we've trained these predictors, what we can do is we can then go to our target um, cell type and make a prediction based on each one and then average their predictions. And this was done at 25 base pair resolution except for DNA methylation, which we did at one base pair resolution, but only for CG sites. Um, and then there's also some um, other details that I haven't put here, but we only used RNA-seq and DNA methylation as targets. We didn't use them to actually form the prediction because we wanted to sort of have a chromatin-based prediction, and also the DNA methylation was um, different in that it was only at um, irregular intervals. And then we also sort of had sets of marks which we had higher confidence in and we only use those to impute other marks, not using the other marks to impute them. Um, so now just to give some details about the regression trees that we used. So um, many of you have probably seen decision trees. Um, regression trees are similar in that they make, but they make numerical predictions, and one of the nice features here is that they could represent, for example, um, the fact that nonlinearity such that the signal would always be positive, for example, um, and can discover certain combinatorial uh, relationships. We have, uh, in the trees, we have split nodes, so you have some nodes that have a feature associated with it and a specific split value. So, for example, it could be the signal of some mark at the position you're trying to predict. And if it was greater than two, you would go one direction. If it was less than two, you would go some other direction. So you get a partitioning of your data points. Um, and then you could have, for example, another split node, which is based on what is the signal of the five nearest neighboring cell types based on a specific mark um, B based on the local distance measure, for example. And if it was Greater than one, you would go here. If it's less than or equal to one, you would go here. And then at the leaves, you have a single numerical prediction. Um, that is the target value of all the training points that get assigned to that specific leaf. So you're partitioning all your training points into some of these leaves. Um, and what, how the learning of the reg regression trees works is it recursively selects um, features and split values. Um, so you're partitioning the training sets based on a specific feature and a split value, and then you recursively um, split the remaining ones. And the specific target is to minimize the squared error on the uh, training data. And I put in my specific implementation, there's other ways to do this, is um, there was a requirement that each of the leaves had at least 20 data points associated with it. We would stop splitting after that point. Um, if you continued splitting, you could pot potentially overfit the um, training data. So this was there to sort of control the overfitting. Um, and now another point about this is with the regression trees, they can be somewhat unstable if you were just using one regression tree. But what we're doing is we're taking an ensemble average of them. Um, and ensemble methods are sort of a very general technique and I mean this is the framework I've described is sort of similar to random forest except we don't have this requirement that we drop features in like each regression tree but this is 
um, ensemble methods you'll see in various bagging or boosting or um, some of these wisdom of the crowd methods. And this is a review, an older review from um, Thomas Dietrich, who sort of had this conceptual argument why ensemble methods are effective. So ensemble methods, what you're doing is you're training multiple different predictors and averaging them when there's potentially just one true concept. And he was making three arguments on why we should expect ensemble methods to be useful. And his sort of three things were statistical, computational, or representational. So the statistical argument here, this is his diagram where H represents the overall hypothesis space that you could sort of search on. So these, this is a space of possible um, individual predictors that you could return. The red F represents the true function, what you ideally would want to return. Um, and then H represents individual predictors that one, um, or individual functions that one could learn. So these would be the members of the ensemble. And one argument is statistical, you don't have enough training data to really converge on the true function. So what would happen is you would learn different um, hypotheses based on different, um, different ensemble members would be sort of learning related things to F, but not exactly F. And then when you average them, you get closer to F. So you sort of average away some of their var variation. Another argument was computational, is you could be in a setting where you might have infinite amount of training data, or I mean, effectively, but that computationally it wouldn't be feasible to actually find the true function. Um, there's a number of ensemble, I mean, methods that people use where it might actually they can prove that it would be, in the general case, NP hard to find the actual true uh, function. And then what would happen is when you run it, you get uh, different local maximums. Um, so H1, H2, H3 could represent different local maximums. And then when you average their predictions, that's, you get a true, um, closer to the true function. And then his sort of third argument in some cases is representational. It might be the case that the true function actually falls outside of the space of hypotheses that you could actually infer from the available um, data and your um, possible model. And it could be the case that even if you had a very general um, predictor that could learn very um, sort of complicated models, it still might be the case on any finite sample of data, what you would um, learn is, I mean, what, what would be feasible to learn on any finite sample of data would still not encapsulate the true function. So that what you would end up learning on your available training data and set of hypotheses is um, something like this, and then when you average them, you get closer to the true function here. Um, so I mean, that's in general, um, in what we're doing here in this setting, we don't actually have sort of the true training data, so it isn't, it's gonna be unlikely just based on um, just having like more samples in the genome, we would actually converge to F with more training data. It might be sort of more of a representational argument by having multiple different predictors, we can um, average away some of that variability while the true function would be potentially slightly outside our space. Um, so now to get to some of the um, results of the method that I had developed here. Uh, so I'm first gonna give you some intuition of its performance. So what I did here is I took um, nine randomly selected 200 KB regions of the genome showing you one or one cell and tissue type for each mark randomly selected. Um, so what you see here is red represents the imputed data and blue is the actual observed data. So, and we're not using information from the observed data when we're imputing this red data. And each pair corresponds to one mark here. Um, and they were chosen from different cell or tissue types. And these are all random locations in the genome. So you can see it's able to capture a lot of the um, information about the marks based on this imputed data that we see from the observed data. Um, and this was all at a 200 base pair resolution. We can also look at varying resolutions. So now this is 
a two megabase resolution, and we can zoom in at 2 KB, and then even go down to um, here. Now I'm showing you at 10 KB, um, and we made the predictions at 25 base pair resolution. So we're able to capture, uh, including nucleosome depletion, um, so very fine features in the data. And this was done uh, genome-wide for more than 4,000 data sets. <coughs> and this is another visualization uh, where I'm showing you, in this case, pairs of heat maps where the top, each pair corresponds to different marks, the rows correspond to different uh, cellular tissue types, the uh, columns randomly selected locations, the, um, within the pair of heat maps you have the observed, and then the imputed, yellow corresponds to greater signal, blue is uh, lower signal, and you can see visually that we're able to capture a lot of the um, sort of structure of the data, including uh, more cell type restricted patterns, for example. Uh, and we've done some quantitative evaluations as well. So in this case, we use two uh, baselines. So one is the average um, signal of a mark given all the other cell types for which we have it available in as one baseline. And another is the best case if you took um, the mark you're interested in from any other cell or tissue type for which it was available. And you had some oracle tell you that this would be the best one to choose. And this is, in practice, um, sort of approximation of how people would often work is if they're interested in some mark and some specific cell type and it's not available, they'll sort of guess what's the best um, or closest cell type to it and use that mark in place. Um, and what I'm showing you in red is the average correlation across all the data sets we um, tried it on. Um, each mark, and the, the x-axis here is different marks. Um, red is based on our method. This is computed at 25 base pair resolution. And then blue is the best case if we used the single best epigenome. And then in green is if we average that mark across the cell types. Um, so it's better in all the cases. And then we could also ask, um, so that was showing you the average of across all the different cell types we predicted on, what fraction of the cell types are we actually better on? And in this case, uh, we're almost always better than just averaging the signal. For a few of the marks, um, the best case for the single epigenome can sometimes do better, but again, you don't know which cell type to use, and still in the majority of the cases, um, we outperform that. So I was also making sort of the point that potentially the imputed data could have some advantages over the actual observed data because it's combining information from lots of closely related cell types. So it's gaining the statistical robustness opposed to potentially relying on one or two noisy experimental data um, experiments. So this is giving you some sense of that. I'm showing you an aggregation plot of the signal where in blue is the observed data and red is the imputed data. This is for H3K4 ME3, which is a mark which is known to be associated with promoter regions. And this is an aggregation plot of H3K36 ME3 across gene bodies. And what you're seeing is there's a much more consistent signal distribution for the imputed data than the observed data. And it's not just like cell type differences. We can see two very different um, patterns for what samples that are supposed to correspond to, for example, the same um, fetal brain type, um, but have very different profiles. <coughs> One um, concern can also be that we're having, uh, we're not doing as well with cell type specific genes. So with imputed day, we're potentially averaging across a number of different um, cell types, we could sort of wash away a lot of the cell type specific patterns. And it is the case that we have more power in genes that are, or regions of the, the genome or signal that's more constitutive. But it, we asked, um, as a function of the number of cell types the gene is expressed in, how well do we recover gene bodies with H3K36 ME3 or promoter regions with H3K4 ME3? And we found that this is showing the area under the curve up to a 5% false positive rate when we rank based on the signal of the imputed and the observed data that 
even as um, for a very small number of cell types, we're better able to recover expressed genes with H3K4 ME3 promoters. Um, and then with K36 ME3, it's competitive for lowly or very cell type specific expressed genes and then um, does increasingly better for um, more expressed genes. And another um, point on the cell type specificity and advantages of potentially the imputed data over the observed data. So what I'm showing you here is correlation matrices between different samples. So the top row corresponds to observed, this one imputed, and again for observed and imputed. And what you see here, these grids are laid out um, based on the known biology of the different samples. And you can see that there's a much clearer block structure visually for the imputed data versus the observed data that in the sense that samples that should be of similar bi biological type have a stronger correlation, while those that are of different types have a lower correlation. Um, and then for some of these marks which weren't done um, any sample, you don't even have correlations for the observed data. And we quantified the relationship. Um, does this imputed data better agree with the known relationship between cell types by ranking pairs of experiments on we rank them based on the correlation with each other, and then the goal was to predict if two samples would be annotated to the same high-level biological grouping. And we scored this based on the area under the ROC curve. And you can see for the imputed data, it um, quite outperformed the observed data, and particularly for some of these more diffuse marks here. And this is consistent with what you can see visually, that there's a much stronger correlation structure. Um, and then I had mentioned another application of the, even if you have observed data, imputed data can be useful as a quality control measure. Um, so what you can do is you can rank each observed data set for how well it agrees with its imputed data set. So you can get a distribution like this. So this was showing you for the roadmap data, a distribution across 127 data sets. Um, in this case, I had a metric on what percentage of the top 1% signal locations agreed with each other. And you can see that there's this tail of data sets for which they're sort of outliers, very small percentage of agreement um, relative to some of these others. So these are potentially data sets you should be concerned about. Um, and then if you draw an aggregation plot of how they look across gene bodies, this is the bottom five. This is H for the mark H3K36ME3. And this is a top five. And this is, if you're familiar with these aggregation plots, a much more sort of natural view. It's very unusual to see H3K36ME3 actually have higher signal near the start of the genes. Um, so we could ask ourselves, there's other metrics that um, have been developed particularly and used within the ENCODE and Roadmap consortiums. And they have all been sort of focused on signal to noise properties of the data set. For example, do you see more um, reads falling in a peak than outside of a peak. But these metrics don't sort of capture the notion that you might be mapping the wrong thing. Like if you have an antibody cross-reacting, you might be capturing the signal for some other mark. And these are data sets which might have stronger signal-to-noise properties, but um, because you're mapping the wrong thing, you should be concerned about. Um, so what we did was we ranked the data sets based on um, how well they agreed with the annotations. So this was looking at H3K36ME3, for which we do have sort of this knowledge that it should, um, in general, overlap with annotated genes. And then what we did was we compared that with um, several other, these sort of signal to noise type metrics. As, so these were the worst data sets um, based on ranking on its screen with annotated genes. And then this was how these other different metrics um, ranked it. So one of the metrics actually considered this the very best, highest quality data set that the consortium had uh, generated. While the imputed agreement with the imputed data was able to flag these four as sort of the, um, some of the worst uh, data sets. And this one also is um, poor. Um, and now another application of the imputed data could potentially be used to interpret genome-wide association studies similar to what's being done with the actual observed data. And we did a head-to-head -head comparison at the signal level between 
the imputed and the observed data, where what we did was we took um, the H3K27 acetylation signal and took a sets of SNPs that were annotated to the same disease in the GWAS catalog, and we took as a background all the other SNPs in the GWAS catalog, and then we did a Mann-Whitney test comparing the signal of those SNPs within a study for a specific cell type versus um, the rest of the SNPs in the catalog. And what you're seeing on the x-axis is the number of studies for which we found um, some cell type enriched at this uh, p-value. And then on the, this one, it's showing you the number of combinations of cell and tissue types and um, disease studies, traits. And red is based on the imputed data, blue is observed data, and this is randomized data. So the imputed data is capturing more, finding more enrichment, so this can make the argument that it's sort of retaining a lot of the more biologically relevant signal while getting rid of some of the um, noise. Um, and then we could also actually go into the specific studies that are having stronger enrichment. So what you're seeing on the x-axis is the p-value based on applying the same statistical test but just using the observed data, and then the y-axis is based on the imputed data. And what I'm showing you is for each trait that was enriched, what was its most significant cell type based on either the observed or imputed data. And in many cases, um, these uh, traits match sort of the biologically relevant cell type to it or something that made sense. And sometimes these wouldn't have been significant if you were doing the same test based on the observed data. And we did this for other marks as well. Um, and we saw similar differences for some of the marks. Other marks, um, it was a smaller difference. Um, and then I had mentioned earlier that another application of this could be for chromatin states. So when we were defining chromatin states based on directly on the observed data, we were limited to just having five marks for which were consistently defined across these 127 reference epigenomes. Um, but now that we have this imputed data, uh, we decided to infer a model based on 12 marks for which we had enough We've seen that mark enough times that we were confident enough with imputation to uh, use it. Uh, I had a separate model just based on all the, almost all the marks, but um, sort of the primary model here was based on these 12 marks where we define chromatin states using um, Chrome HMM multivariate hidden Markov model where if you were at my talk um, during the first week, you would have heard uh, details about how this works. Um, and this is showing you at some genomic location the chromatin state assignments in each cell or tissue type. And we can also uh, do various analyses similar to before and ask if we compare the observed and um, imputed base chromatin states, how well do they agree with annotated genes or um, bodies or promoter regions, and also we've done some with expressed genes. And those arguments, again, suggest that um, on over, overall, the imputed data can have um, some nicer properties based on these metrics than the observed data. But, I mean, it's not the case that, like, every case it'll be correct, the imputed data. It's it'll be vulnerable to both um, false positives and false negatives, but showing, on average, it can have um, better performance based on these metrics. And the final thing I wanted to discuss here is about mark prioritization. So there's this question that comes up, given that you have sort of many different marks one could map and only a smaller number which would actually be practical to map, which ones should you do? And it turns out there's sort of a very important distinction in how you look at this problem. One is from the point of view, do you have an informative existing compendium that you could leverage? Or are you trying to say, I'm in some cell type and I'm not gonna look at any other sort of cell types for which I do have the data available, and I want marks which sort of have the most distinct information from each other. So it turns out that there's a certain set of marks which um, don't correlate well with any other marks. So they could be found in locations of the genome where no other marks are found in. And if you wanted to sort of comprehensively cover the epigenome in those cell types just using data from that cell type, 
those would be marks that would be important to prioritize. So this is saying, looking at sort of how well we could map various marks, given we had every other mark available just using features based on the same cell type. Um, and then performance is relative to if we looked at all the available information. And what comes out is marks like H3K36 um, ME3, H3K27 ME3, H3K9 ME3 are some of the most difficult to predict. And these were actually marks that were prioritized by the roadmap consortium. So you could see that sort of they were trying to cover very distinct marks that would basically cover the space. But if you now take the point of view of we have this compendium of data available, how much additional information are we gaining by mapping this mark in another cell type? Then the sort of situation changes because it turns out that some of the marks uh, that might be most informative within one cell type, you don't gain very much information by continually mapping it in additional cell types because these marks could be very constitutive across cell types or also in many cases um, sort of have very relatively low signal to noise property. Um, so in this case, um, if we looked at the point of view of if we just had for example, two marks, H3K18 acetylation and H3K, H3K79 ME2, and we made the assumption that we had an informative compendium of data. It turns out that um, based on some of the metrics we were using, we could do as well as if we had um, sort of some of the six most prioritized marks of the consortium. But I mean, this is assuming you already have an informative compendium. But once you have it, and then you're asking the question, what marks should I prioritize for this new cell type? Given that I already have all this data accumulated, you would probably more likely want to do one of these more dynamic marks with a strong signal to noise ratio, opposed to one of these more constitutive marks um, which have a lower signal to noise ratio. Um, so just to summarize, I presented to you Chrome Impute, which was a method to impute epigenetic data um, genome-wide and it can predict data sets which haven't been mapped experimentally and then it potentially can provide a more robust version of a data set um, even if it's been experimentally mapped and it's also now a resource available of uh, more than 4,000 data sets where we made over 500 billion predictions and chromatin states are defined on those as well. Um, and this was work, uh, it started uh, towards the end of my postdoc and I continued working on it um, while I've been at UCLA. And it was done in the context of the Roadmap Epigenomics Consortium. So there's a number of people involved in generating and processing the data and then also some of the data involved came um, from the ENCODE project. And that's the um, website of it. Questions? Well, I haven't really seen the questions, so maybe I'll ask the questions now. Okay. Um, so, 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 why do you think of it as an imputation and not like error correction or something like that? Um, I, I mean, I guess there's two points of view. One is from the point of view of if you have, for the mark, in a cell type for which you don't have any data. It's effectively a missing yeah. data problem. I mean, from the point of view of when we do already have a mark in a given cell type, um, I mean, you could think of it as basically denoising, but the way we set it up, we're not actually using that mark. So, I mean, there could be other versions of this approach which combine the actual mark signal with the imputed data. We did do some experiments, and oftentimes it didn't actually help actually using the observed data because you would have to sort of figure out if you should trust that observed data set or not, and it wasn't always clear how to do that, but there's potentially more work in that direction. No, but do you think that could be that way, like where every observed data point has some probability of being there, and then you So, I mean, you're, you're talking specifically about sort of the denoising the cases where you actually have the observed um, data. Um, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, we, I did sort of think about whether we should be doing that, and I mean, there was a couple of reasons that, 
um, I sort of went the direction I did. I mean, one is some of these applications, for example, like quality control. It's better if you just do the predictions without the observed data, so you have sort of this unbiased comparison of the imputed data versus the observed data. And also, when you're doing, for example, the um, like chromatin states, it could, again, potentially be very confounded if you had the observed data for that mark versus if you didn't. If you just used an imputed data set of all the marks, it sort of becomes um, less likely to confound some of the downstream analyses to be that dependent on whether that mark was mapped in the cell type. But I, I definitely agree with you that there are applications where it would make sense to sort of use all the available information in, of the, that specific observed data set plus the other information to sort of to denoise it. Um, we did do some evaluations and sort of along those lines, what we did was we took a weighted average of the observed data set and the imputed data set and then saw if it like would perf improve performance for according to some metrics and it basically put all the weight on the imputed data set um, in terms of finding the optimal value in the way we did it. But there definitely could be more work in that direction. So the question is like, to which marks are more, um, I mean, more f affected by genetic variation versus environmental or variation? Um, yeah, I mean, and then there's also like the experimental confounders. Um, I mean, so when I was looking at the, those correlation heat maps, I mean, you could see for like marks like H3K27 of settle and H3K4MA1, I mean, they better tracked with the actual s sort of cell type identity, but I mean, these are more cell type specific marks. Once you're looking at marks like H3K36ME3 or K27ME3 or K9ME3, what would happen is they wouldn't correlate that well with the sort of actual cell type if you're looking at a genome-wide level. And so there must be other things such as potentially environmental or genetic or um, experimental, which is having a greater influence whether it's actually, I mean, it's relative to the actual sort of biological signal. It's hard to sort of say that the actual genetic control is stronger for those locations. It's just saying that it's stronger relative to the signal. Um, and there's also been work sort of to understand the relationship between the genetics and the histone modifications. Um, I mean, work from uh, Jonathan Pritchard, Yoav Gilad, um, Mike Snyder, and Manolis Dermatakis's labs have profiled a number of histone modifications across individuals within the cell type and then have been comparing that to the um, genetic variation. Um, and I mean, some of the marks like H3K27, ME3, some of the more diffuse marks, they found sort of fewer places in the genome which they could associate the genetic variation with the epigenetic variation. But again, that could be a power issue or it could be a um, sort of actual biology. Yes? Yes. 
Um, so, yeah, I mean, right now we don't have um, sort of individual level data. It's usually just the level of like one sample per cell or tissue type. Um, I mean, it, so it can be a mix. I mean, in general, we're not using any sort of metadata saying that this individual um, we had multiple samples from. I mean, a few cases you do have, they did take a f couple different places from them, but in some cases also in generating these reference, they didn't have enough reads from one individual, so they had to like combine data from two individuals to it. So, um, I mean, I think sort of like models that sort of reason about like which individuals this mark experiment came from, um, I mean, could be a direction, but I think that would be sort of, um, once there's sort of more data at the individual level would be natural. Any other questions? Yeah, I mean, so the way I get sort of variation among the regression trees in this framework was I was using different targets. So basically each cell type, you would have a different um, output. And then also I was having this requirement that I use the same sort of common set of features available. So then I would have, um, sometimes it would be using different subsets of features based on that requirement. So, and then, I mean, the features would be defined differently because the predictor cell type was also, I mean, the actual feature values would be different because the predictor cell type was different. So all those combined caused sort of variation in the actual regression trees you had. And so you would have different features on the root or different split values and such. And then um, you could average them. And then sometimes if I didn't have enough actual target cell types for some of the cell types which were only mapped in like fewer than 10 cell types, what I would do is I would form different samples of the training data, and that was increased the um, robustness by learning trees on different samples. But once you had enough sort of other cell types, that didn't really add much value. Um, and then, I mean, in general, ensemble methods can either be done like variations of the same overall predictor, or some people have very different types of predictors and try to combine them. Okay, well, thank you.